What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Couple Things. With Sean and Andrew. A podcast all about couples. And the things they go through. Today, we have Jordan and Matt Dooley. I'm really excited about this. So, we've known Matt Dooley for 10, 15 years, yeah. maybe. We played the same position in football. He was a long snapper. I was a long snapper. We kind of meshed over that. And then Matt married Jordan, who my sister actually really admires and looks up to. Jordan is an author. She's a podcaster. She's Entrepreneur. A, yeah, she does it all. And I think you're going to really like these two. And also, if you just listen to the podcast, you don't check out our main channel, we're going to be doing some house tours. You might have noticed the change in scenery. We're excited to bring it to you. So go ahead and jump over to the East Family YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get to it. Wow. Matt, Jordan, this is an interview I'm excited about for several different reasons. One, Jordan just came out with a new book called Embrace Your Almost. Yes. Freaking pumped to talk about that. My sister is a massive fan of Jordan. I know. So she's going to geek out about this. Yes. And it's fun because Matt and I have known each other for like probably 10 years. Long snappers. Long snappers. You guys are a, a, a tight knit squad. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah. Matt, do you remember? This is actually Sean and I's third date when this happened. You were snapping at IU, and Sean and I came by a practice. Yeah. While you were in the uh, stadium at IU, and we met up. That was like our third. That was part of my selling point for why Sean should date me, is I know cool people. Like <laughs> you. <laughs> do you remember this? Well, happy to say I helped seal the it deal. Was. Yes, yes. That was, we, we rode a tandem bicycle there, which I'm surprised we were still dating after that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Didn't that go was well. Funny. That was probably, when did, what year was that? Do you remember? I wonder if we were. 2013. 13. Okay, that was the year we met. We met toward the end of 2013, mm. so it might have been like right before we met. Yeah. But, so. Speaking wow, of, crazy. how did you guys meet? Okay, you can tell the story because the way he tells it is okay. more entertaining. <laughs> so we, IU, beat Penn State in football for the first time in school history back in 2013, and it was a big deal. Um, and she followed me on Instagram um, because she went to high school with a couple of guys on the team and was like a big-time football fan, not like a huge basketball fan, like always loved football. Which is odd. And IU. I was like actually thrilled that we won because I used football team didn't win a lot back then. <laughs> so, Jeez. so um, yeah, so she followed me. Um, I like to say that she was. You kinda, and others. I yeah. was following the team out of excitement. But then he followed <laughs> wow. me back. Yeah, I, I, I followed her back, but <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll always say, like, you know, she was, you know, throwing the net out and I was the fish that, like, flopped in. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, it was. And then eight we. Eight years later. Yeah, you know, it's been seven or eight years now, but we. Nine. It'll almost be nine, nine this fall. We yeah. um, connected after, like, realizing we had some mutual friends and stuff and um, realized he lived across the street from me, which was kind of interesting. And so he was like, well, I'm just going to walk over and meet you then. Because we had, like, kind of crossed paths and, like, known of each other and seen each other for a while at that point. So when we finally did connect and actually asked, like, where have I met you? And we realized he hadn't. He walked over, knocked on my door. Yep. And my, I didn't really think he was going to come. I thought he was just like being a flirty football player. And so I was like, this guy is not showing up. I had just got home from the gym, like was not looking my best, not feeling my best. And my roommates are like, oh, yeah, he's totally just flirting via text. Like he's not coming. And like five minutes later, there's a knock at the door and everyone's just like, <gasps> yeah. and I'm like, what do I do? <laughs> oh, my god. So anyways, ended up opening the door and we talked for like four or five hours that night. We always say it was like catching up with an old friend. And that's kind of where everything started. And then when he proposed, yeah. he knocked on my door, my parents' front door when I was living with them after college again. So, yeah. My dad called the door <laughs> That's really cool. I will say, Dang. last corny joke about snappers. It must be someone with you snappers because he did the same thing. It was one of those like, oh, I think he's just like texting flirting yeah and i was i said like the same thing you want to come over and he showed yeah. up and i was like oh my god what do i do yeah <laughs> take Didn't your shot that. Yeah. right <laughs> yeah. totally i'm like i've had i had my experience with guys before <laughs> i had my experience with guys before who would say that kind of thing yeah and i would be like okay whatever and they never show, or lost. they wouldn't show up and then at 11 p.m they'd be like hey can i come yeah. over and it's like no you cannot <laughs> that's not what no, i was us, intending us snappers don't mess around <laughs> That's right. The gentlemanly, the gentlemanliness. We make plays, just not on the yep. football field. <laughs> Usually not. A, <laughs> uh, oh my god. Well, Matt, scary. Matt was way better than I was. Side note. Uh, you said it was like catching up with an old friend. What is it that you think makes you two so compatible? I'm curious. Hmm. That's a good question. 
I think, um, you know, I think being in a college town like Bloomington, um, you're going to school with, you know, 40,000 other kids. I, I think to find somebody who has similar values as mm-hmm. you do, um, really, it catches your attention. Mm-hmm. It, it's not something that's, you know, very common. And so um, to really align with somebody, mm-hmm. you know, like, this is this is a person I want to be around, mm-hmm. like, at least for the short term, mm-hmm. potentially for the long term. I knew that <laughs> night I was going to marry her. I think she's still coming around to the idea. <laughs> But <laughs> I, I knew from the get go. Yeah, I, I would I would echo that. And I also think like, you know, when you're very like minded with someone and you find yourself almost like finishing each other's sentences in one of your first meetings or one of your first conversations, it's kind of it, it does kind of make you be like, this is just different. And I remember I, I remember when we first met. I ha- it hadn't been too long since I got out of a relationship. And so I wasn't really like super eager. And I, and I was kind of like, Hmm, I don't know if I'm really into him. Cause I didn't have butterflies or I didn't mm-hmm. have like the like giddiness that I had had in other experiences, but I always describe it. Like I just had this deep peace. Like it was just almost better than having butterflies. Once I thought about it later and as I like kind of reflected, but I thought maybe that meant I wasn't into it or I didn't like him. But what I think I really realized is like this, there's just something solid here. It's not giddy. It's not, you know, fireworks right away. It's just like connection. It's, there's a foundation here that could be really solid that we could build on. Um, so I think that was another kind of differentiator for me too. Can you guys walk us back to, so in 2013, when you met, you guys were what year in college? I was a junior and she was a sophomore. Mm -hmm. Okay. So junior and sophomore, Jordan, had you already kind of ventured into your entrepreneur like ambitions? No, not at all. I was no, I had no idea what I wanted to do. This is part of the kind of a funny part of the story because I attribute a lot of what I've been doing now with like podcasting and books and everything else to him because I was kind of like super academic. I was like, you know, just had to get straight A's. And now I look back like, why live your life? But anyway, um, I was just so stressed about like having, you know, best like high honors and everything else. And he was a college athlete and he had taken up guitar kind of as a creative outlet. And that was kind of his like release just in being a high in a high stress situation. And it was my junior end of my junior year going into the summer before senior year. And he was like, you know, you need like a creative outlet. And at the time I had been doing a lot of like hand lettering and doodling. And it was like how I was remembering. I was just doing a lot of creative stuff. And he's like, maybe you should like start an Etsy shop. And I remember thinking like, dang, for a football player, like it's a pretty artsy thing to know about, but cool. Like, and at the time, like that was, I wasn't even super familiar with what Etsy was. So I was kind of like, how do you even know what that is? So I started looking into it and kind of just started it as a hobby. But I think what he didn't know about me at the time is I'm really bad at having hobbies. Like anything I like, I turn into like a business. And so within a year, it was like a full blown, like by my senior year, I was like paying my roommates in pizza to help me like package and ship all of these items out of my Etsy store, <laughs> out of like my Etsy store closet. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how everything got started on the internet and just started growing from there. But kind of rewinds back to him suggesting I take up a hobby and it turned into a lot more than a hobby. <laughs> that's amazing. So soul scripts and own an Academy, which of those, which of those came first? Soul Scripts came first. That was the Etsy store. That was actually what the Etsy store started as. And then that kind of evolved and really exploded, especially among like college women. Cause right after I graduated, I went and started to speak on college campuses and we started a sweatshirt line that just exploded. Um, And so that's kind of where everything was birthed out of. And then it just all kind of evolved from there. And then we added Own an Academy a few years later and it's just kind of continued. So, and then two more timeline questions just before yeah. we branch into like deeper topics. So yeah. when you guys graduated, how soon after, or had you already been married? So he graduated 2015. I graduated 2016. He proposed the summer before my senior year. We were engaged for 14 months and then we got married in September of 2016. So I had only been gra- out of school for like three months at that point, And he had okay. been out of school for about a year. So then my question is, that sounds like a lot is happening at the same time. So you guys are graduating, engaged, married, your business starts taking off. And then Matt, you're headed into the NFL. Yeah. So I had actually, so I graduated the same year as Andrew. Um, and I didn't get signed that first year. I just did mini camp with the Steelers. And so that was the summer that I went home. I trained for a little bit, flew out, proposed to her. Used all the money he had left yeah. <laughs> to propose. <laughs> and then um, I ended up moving out to Indiana full time that fall. Got a job working for a medical device company. Um, did that for five months and got a call from the Steelers. They brought me in for a workout early 2016. Got signed and then uh, did a preseason with them and got cut 
after the first preseason game, two weeks before our wedding. So no pressure, had no, no other job lined up. <laughs> well, it was so interesting but, because yeah. they had told us like Labor Day weekend is like a great weekend to do that. Like if you're going to get married, that's going to be like your one chance in this whole craziness. And then we found out that just the way that it worked out that year, the Steelers rounds, like final round of cut would have been like on our wedding day. And I was like, I will never forgive myself if he gets cut because he like flew here for our wedding. So luckily I got cut three weeks or two weeks earlier. So no pressure. Yeah. So that kind of was a a little bit of a stressful place to start our marriage off on because we had no idea we were going to end up. And that kind of was a crazy first year kind of in and out and trying to figure out what was next. But it's interesting because you've both been in positions where the... Uh, I've heard it described as being the kite and then the other person is the kite holder where Mm -hmm. like one person's out doing their thing and chasing their dreams. The other is kind of like, you know, playing support. Yeah. Supporting where initially it was Matt playing college football, Jordan, you were, you know, just doing college and crush, you know, doing really well in academics, which I know nothing about how to do (laughs) that. And then Matt, you know, you went through this phase and, Jordan is writing books and launching companies. How, how have you encouraged and supported each other through uh, the phases where the other is the kite and out chasing their ambitions? Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, it's, it's a learning curve, especially because I think part of our experience was it was like everything flipped kind of unexpectedly. Like we were on the track for NFL stuff. It seemed to be working out. I loved being in the cheerleader role. Like I really enjoyed that. Honestly, a large part of the reason I kind of kept running with my business and I added some other creative things when it was first getting started just to keep it going. Like I added in some wedding photography and blogging and just it was like making stuff work because I was focused on supporting his dream and me knowing I can't just like take a job in a city. I'm going to have to probably follow wherever he goes. So it was always the first, at least the first couple of years of my business, it was just to make it work for his dream and to help fund everything that he was doing with training and everything else. Um, and I enjoyed that. I really loved that. But then what was interesting is as a result of that, it was like a couple years into our marriage, my thing had completely taken over. He had hung up his cleats and it was like, he was fully in the support role and we weren't really prepared for that. We never really talked about, or how do you prepare for that kind of whole 360 shift? Um, and there was a season in our marriage where I think that was kind of tough on us because there were some unmet expectations on both sides. We didn't really know quite how to navigate that. And then we met with, and he was thinking about actually leaving his job, especially before my first book came out because I was going to go on a national book tour and they were going to send me out like by myself basically. And I was like, I don't want to do that. You need to come with me. So he was thinking about leaving his job, but I remember just feeling a little bit like uneasy about that. And we met with these um, like mentors in our life and the guy had played for the Colts for a long time. And the gal was like a creative kind of personality a lot like me. So we really connected with them and we just were not entirely sure what was next. And they looked at us and they said, Matt, what's Jordan's dream? Like, what would be her dream come true with everything that's happening? Or what would be a dream in her life? And he said, best-selling author. You know, he kind of said all these big things. And then she was like, okay, now what would be Matt's dream? And I knew that he at that point was like at peace with like football is done. Like we're past that season. He was kind of like looking for a new dream, I think, in that season. He hadn't really 100%. And Andrew, I don't know if you relate to this, but kind of figuring out like, what do I want to do now? You know, that kind of fog and that next step and figuring that out. Um, and so he was in that season. So I, I responded, I was like, I think he'd be really satisfied, like coaching high school football and fishing. Like it was, he wanted a simple life to be honest. And they looked at us, they were like, okay, that's awesome. Very different things. So you guys need to figure out how to get on the same page. And they basically just encouraged us. Like, have you ever sat down and had a dream date? Like, have you ever dreamed together? Because you've both ridden some like high highs and low lows, like in the last couple of years. And have you ever like actually sat down and written down, like, here's what we want to build together. Even if one of us is leading or pursuing a big dream in the driver's seat and the other's more in a support role. And we hadn't ever done that. And I think that was really pivotal for us to get on the same page, to understand like, this is a season. How can we really support one another in it and really chase a common dream for our family and our future, even if one of us is kind of leading in in that way. So that's, I mean, that's what I would say. Yeah. I I think just to kind of go off of that. So like after just to back up. So after we got married, um, I was still, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to give it, you know, I think nine months or it was yeah, no, you November said through May. Yeah. You said yeah, about a so, year. Yeah. Seven months. Um, if I'm not on team May 1st, then I'm done. Um, cause Andrew, you know, like there, there'll always be another workout, mm-hmm. you know, another, you know, another coach will call your mm-hmm. agent will call. Hey, I got you this. So I think for me, it was important to have that kind of like, psychological divide of like, okay, it doesn't matter if somebody calls it 1201 AM on May 1st, I'm done. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
in, in that process, I, I was like, okay, how can I make myself useful in a way, even though I'm like pursuing athletics fully right now and I'm all in. Um, so I, I taught her photography mm -hmm. and gave her a skill, an asset to use to go and, you know, shoot weddings and engagement shoots and family mm -hmm. shoots and all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff like that. So I think a lot of it is just really finding where your strengths are mm -hmm. and uh, like no jobs too small, mm -hmm. like really humbling yourself and just saying, all right, how can I help? Mm -hmm. And getting to that point to start mm -hmm. um, because a lot of stuff will fall in line mm -hmm. after that. I think it's just a matter of being willing to, you know, um, not overlook any, any option, you know, any potential option. Yeah. I remember um, same timeline. So 2015, 2016, we were engaged getting married in 2016. Andrew had been picked up by the chiefs and then cut on, I think similar timing. But I remember we were both kind of bouncing around doing different things. And I, I came home one day because I was doing a tour and Andrew told me he had signed up to be an Uber driver. And I remember navigating Same. that fog though. And it, it comes in waves and phases for both people. But I remember listening to that and hearing him and internally almost being mad at him. Cause I was like, that's okay, but you can't limit yourself to that. Like, you're, you're setting your bar too low. So for us, there's been all of these like peaks and valleys of like trying to figure out how to challenge each other. How do you guys continue to like challenge each other to go for a bigger thing than you're doing now and m still making sure that it's the other person's dream? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I can relate to that too, because, you know, there was times where he was like working for a moving company and it was almost like his need to feel like I'm not like when I'm not on a team or whatever, I'm not necessarily feeling like I'm contributing, even though I'm working toward it, like I'm investing in the future and I, it's an unknown future. I don't know if it's going to work out. So there is that like need to feel like you're doing something. But And, I think and people don't know how little you get paid as a NFL, <laughs> as an undrafted. Wait, like, you got paid? Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I... I had an apartment back in Indy and I was, when I was with Pittsburgh, I'm making, I'm living in a hotel making like $325 a week mm -hmm. and I still have rent to pay back home. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, I, I, I had issues with, you know, friends and, uh, you know, family who were like, Hey, like, why can't you give me tickets? It's like, uh, cause I have to buy these tickets yeah. and I don't have any money, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. like I'm saving up. We have a wedding, we have a honeymoon, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think, and there's definitely that scrapper mentality. Like I signed up for Uber and Lyft. I was driving for Uber and Lyft and I, mm -hmm. you know, worked for a moving company. And it was like, I, I, I think as a, and I, maybe, I don't know, maybe this is just be, being a college athlete um, or and professional athlete. Like all you've ever done for 20 years is sports. Mm -hmm. And you've been told like, you're an athlete, you're an athlete, you're an athlete, you're an athlete or whatever it is. And I think we can kind of build those walls in our own mind. Like, Oh, well, I guess I just have to do something in that world. pertains to this mm -hmm. versus like having somebody come alongside you and say, well, why don't you do this? Like, you'd be great at this. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like I just got my real estate license earlier this year. Mm -hmm. So I'm, cool. you know, I'm, I'm a realtor here in Indy and, um, like, it, it's just like, I'm, I'm growing myself in different ways. Cause mm -hmm. she encouraged me. Like, she's like, you know, you'd be really good at this. Like mm -hmm. we've got a great network. You know, like you're a great people person, like you have integrity um, and you, you know, the India area well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And I knew, I think I, I, sometimes I think the other person can see it in you when you need a challenge. And I think like he had been doing some different freelancing roles and, ha and like having success with it, but I think he was also starting to crave a challenge again. And I started to identify that like the athlete in him needed a challenge again. Mm -hmm. And so I was really kind of trying to say like, Hey, why don't you go for that? Like you have nothing to lose. If it doesn't work out, you hate it. Like Okay, we've lost what 500 bucks on, you know, the education, like, go for it, you know, and just identifying um, when it, when the other could use a challenge. And there's mm -hmm. also, I think, on the flip side, kind of even what you were saying, Sean, like, it can reverse where there's been times where he's had to challenge me to say, hey, let's define enough, like, because otherwise we can just like drive ourselves into the ground chasing the next big thing. And we walked through a season of loss and some health issues and things that I was going through. So in that, like I was starting to express, like, I think I need to reduce my stress levels. Like there's always going to be a next thing to achieve. And I will never forget a conversation we had. I actually wrote about it in the book, but 
we were at the beginning of a year and I had just walked through loss and I was like trying to re kind of evaluate where I wanted to put my time and spend my energy. And like, I had just spent four years like working so hard trying to like do that. And so I said to him, I, I need to reduce stress levels. And he was like, okay. And we were planning for the year and he pointed to a project that I had like that I was planning. And he goes, what do you want to make on this project? Like, what's your goal? And I just like threw out some random number. And he's like, okay, awesome. Why? And I remember thinking like, what do you mean? Why? And he's like, well, why is that your goal? Like, that's a great goal. But do you have like, why is it your goal? And that was a challenge for me. Cause I didn't know how to answer that. I was like, it sounds good. I've done that before. My friends do that. Like, I don't know. I didn't really have a real, like deep purposeful answer for it. And that was really what kickstarted a conversation between us of like, are we arbitrary, arbitrarily pursuing something that sounds good without it actually being aligned with what we really value or what's most important in our life right now, which we've just identified as reducing stress and health and things like that. So I think the challenging can go both ways, not only to challenge you to dream bigger and to go for something that's, that you have the potential to do, but also to know when like, Hey, you've done a lot, like also be present and enough is enough. And like, that's not to say settle. That's not to say play small, but to challenge you not to like overexert yourself, just chasing some arbitrary thing that looks shiny, but maybe isn't even healthy for you. So we've had to learn how to do that both ways. That's freaking deep. Mm -hmm. I, I, honestly, the, the, <laughs> the concept of defining enough, mm -hmm. uh, it kind of sparks intentionality, right? Like again, not, it's not encouraging to thinking small. It's saying, Hey, why are we doing this? Like maybe right. Sean has a, a goal that she wants to, before we die, uh, be responsible for like raising or donating a hundred million dollars. So it's mm. like, okay, that's cool. I never, that, that's a massive goal to me, <laughs> but it's now it's not just like, Hey, let's, you know, let's just keep buying stuff and upgrading this and doing this. It's like, it, it doesn't, it's just saying this is the threshold and this is why, you know? So I mm -hmm. think that's so powerful. All right, let's take a break to thank our sponsor today, AG1. We really can't thank AG1 enough. We have it legit like every single day, if not multiple times a day. It really is the first thing I do in the morning. Sometimes I even do it twice a day if I'm feeling real saucy. That's what she said. <laughs> I do it even before I have coffee. And I usually put one scoop of AG1 in water, grab a spoon from the sink sometimes, Sometimes a dirty spoon. It's a used always spoon, a dirty spoon. And then I mix it up. He's not lying. It's so gross. And I'll never understand why you wouldn't just grab a clean one from the drawer that's like right there. It's called reducing, reusing, and recycling. And sometimes babe. you use a dirty cup with dirty water in it. It like it doesn't matter. Negates it doesn't matter. the whole thing. I just thing. don't want to have to dirty another spoon. Plus, with just one scoop of AG1, I get 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole foods, sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to start the day. That's right. It also supports mental clarity and alertness. And as a parent, we need that to be on our toes and ready for the day. So it's a must in the mornings. To make it easy for you, Athletic Greens is gonna give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash East fam. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash East fam to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Let's get back to it similar to you something that i i voiced that to him quite a bit just because i i personally have been working with in this world longer and so i've yeah. reached like burnout and stuff uh, many yeah. times and i got to a point within our career where you have to ask that question like what's enough because we're yeah. constantly striving to do more make more be more and we we said that i think a week ago where i was like okay enough chasing for us yeah. Like, let's put our competitive drive because I know that's not ever going to stop somewhere else. And I was like, let's do a ridiculous number. Throw it out there. A hundred million dollars towards like a foundation because then, like you said, you're actually chasing a purpose instead of saying I need yes. more and more and more. But yeah. with that, um, have you guys, I, I feel like I know the answer within your book, but um, have you guys reached burnout within your careers and how did you deal with that personally and with each other? Yeah. I mean, I have a hundred percent. Um, and I think maybe in different ways so you can speak to your experience, but, um, I think, I mean, I found out like I had like physical manifestations of burnout to where like, I, it was so funny. I started getting some health testing done, especially through seasons of loss and like pregnancy loss and things like that. And it was interesting because one of the th primary things that we found was that they checked like my cortisol levels and my levels were like across, like it's supposed to have this healthy curve to it. 
it didn't curve at all. It just like didn't go up every anywhere. And I was like, Oh, perfect. I'm not stressed. Like, that's great. And the provider I was working with was like, no, you've been so chronically stressed for so long. Your adrenals are tapped and your cortisol's in the toilet. Like that's not healthy. And so it was almost like, Oh, it's not just like that. I feel tired and I'm burned out. It's like my body's actually like struggling to keep up energy. And so that was a big, like eye opening thing for me. And that's when I really started to shift, like a lot of the way that I work and the things that I was pursuing and the, and just honestly, not even the things I was pursuing, the pace at which I was pursuing them. Like I kind of got to that point where I was like, Oh, maybe I don't have to achieve all of this by 30. Like if I did it by 31, life would be okay. You know? Um, so I think just kind of, and he's honestly, we call him the string to my balloon. So when you said that about the kite earlier, I was kind of like, that's a really good, like kind of metaphor, um, or visual. And he was kind of the one that was kind of just always like asking the intentional questions to make sure it wasn't like, Hey, don't dream. Hey, don't go do anything. It was just like, what's most important in this season and how do we make sure everything supports that? Um, and kind of, yeah, I think healing from not only burnout, but also like physical, like tapped adrenals, um, and learning how to support my body better and still work, um, was something I think you really helped me with just kind of bringing a little bit more of like a, Hey, this doesn't all have to happen this year. Mm. Like it's okay. You know, um, and just giving myself that permission over and over and over. Cause it can be so easy to get caught up in the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Um, and just working at a more slow pace. And you even encouraged mm-hmm. me to take like the summer off. Like all I did was post on social media. I didn't launch anything. Yeah. I didn't create anything new. My book was done at that point. And I pretty much just posted on social and lived my life in the summer. And it was really freeing for me for the first time to be like, oh, I could take a break and this thing's still going to go. Mm-hmm. And like, it's okay. It does. I don't have to be like micromanaging everything. So that would be, I think my answer to that. Yeah. And I, I don't know if I've experienced burnout, but I think you can, um, I, I guess with the NFL and professional sports, you can get a little jaded, mm-hmm. um, at the whole process. Um, you know, just with the politics involved and it's really easy to get caught up into that mm-hmm. um, versus just kind of like keeping your head down and working. Mm-hmm. So I, I think when you do feel yourself start to lose the love for something, because like for, for me with football, it was never like I love football. I wanted to do football for the rest of my life. It was always a vehicle. So like for me, it was like, hey, I learned how to throw a ball between my legs. I got a full ride scholarship. And let's see how far I can ride this train. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I think viewing it as a vehicle had, like helped me um, because I know a lot of people who like still struggle. And mm-hmm. I, I, there are times where it's like, yeah, you know, that, that'd be real fun. Like I, I miss the, the locker room atmosphere, mm-hmm. you know, the, the camaraderie that you just don't get anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think there's, there's stages of that. Um, but when you do start to, you know, experience burnout or question why you're doing something, I think that's when it's important to kind of take a step back and say, okay, where am I at with this whole thing? Why did I start this in the first place Mm -hmm. and get back to the root? Mm -hmm. Mm. It is, it's fun to think about, I mean, your title of the book, embrace your almost, uh, the subtitle is find clarity and contentment and the in-betweens, the not quites and the unknowns. And that resonates so well with uh, how I look back on my football career. Uh, but it's really, this book is really kind of like a, a roadmap through, it seems like not only your journey, but, but everybody in the like dreaming process, really. I'm curious, um, you've alluded to it a little bit, but it doesn't seem like this book launch has been this, you've approached it the same way as you have previous book launch, book launches. And I know you posted about this, but talk to us a little bit how, how uh, previous ones have gone versus this one. Yeah. So the first one, I mean, it was like all in and we did all the things and we, this was still a great effort and all in, but it was interesting because with the first one, we did a full national book tour. How many, we did 10 cities in nine, nine cities in 10 days. Nine cities in 10 days. But it wasn't, it wasn't like we were on a tour bus and going from one side of the country to the other. It was like, we're going to go from Nashville to Dallas to LA to North Carolina, back to Chicago. Like nothing about it made any sense, but it was just the way things worked out. And so we were doing back to back to back to back to back to back events with like hundreds of women. And so you're standing there inter- interacting with everyone, going to bed, getting up, flying, do the, you know, over and over. So I think that is actually where I kind of, I was already starting to burn out. And then that just kind of like was the straw that broke the camel's back where not only did we do those 10 cities, but then cities kept getting added and added and added. So I think we did 16 total or something within a couple of oh. months. And so <clears throat> that process um, was so much fun. And I think it was like the best way I could have launched a first book. But when they asked me like, do you want to do a tour again this time? I was like, 
maybe a couple regional signings, but it was just like, I didn't feel that I want to go out on the road and like sell out a book tour again. It was more like, let's do what's sustainable. So we did a launch event, um, on launch day. And then we've got a couple other signings upcoming over the next month or two, but it's just done in such a more like sustainable way. Um, not as exciting up front, but like, and not as much up front, but I think in a way that feels healthier, um, and, and more doable. So yeah, we took a, diff- a slightly different approach to how we would go about at that time. So I want to jump back. Um, Matt, how did you propose? <laughs> so you, you heard the, how we met, like I, you know, I knocked on her door. Um, so I had flown in to, uh, South Bend, which is where she's from, um, Northern Indiana. And, um, actually, no, I flew into Indy and drove up, mm-hmm. um, borrowed a friend's car, um, drove up to her house and she was actually getting ready. I think it was the next day or two. I was about to fly out to Arizona to see him for a couple of weeks and him. Yeah. yeah, Or a week. And his, my mom and I, mom and him like kind of made this plan. Yeah. I I coordinated with her family and, uh, you know, I asked her dad for his blessing. Oh, and he said no at first. (laughs) Her dad's awesome. (laughs) No, no, seriously. Like it was so funny. Just threw me off. But, um, as a joke, I, I had, yeah, was, yeah. Okay. He was okay. like, was "I'm joke. just." What he yeah. said he, before you could even say anything, he like knew why he was there. Yeah, he was like, "Before you say anything, like the answer is no," <laughs> and you know, just chuckle. And I was like, my heart did drop for a second. I was like, "Uh, okay, this is awkward." <laughs> oh, no. um, but that's just the way. Like he's he's just funny. So mm-hmm. um, ended up they were getting ready to go out to dinner with uh, clients yeah. of uh, her dad's, and I got down on a knee, rang the doorbell. And waited for like five minutes. Like I rang the doorbell like three different times because like everyone else in the house heard the doorbell ring except her. I did. And her mom was like, "Go get the door." And she's like, "Well, I can't." Blah blah blah. I was like getting so ready. Or she something. ended up finally get. I like I switched knees like four different times. I got football <laughs> knees. Like um, so. I felt so bad. But my mom's like the door. She's like, "Oh, the doorbell rang. You need to go get the door." I was like, "The doorbell didn't ring. I didn't hear anything." She's like, "No, it definitely did." I was like. Well, then you go get it. I'm getting ready. She's like, no, you need to. And so then I'm like, something is up. Like, so like you're acting very weird. So, yeah. So I, I was on a knee when she opened the door and, um, I said something along the lines of like the last time I knocked on your front door, you know, it worked out pretty well. So I thought I'd give it another shot. Oh, so that's cute. That, that was the, yeah. uh, yeah, that's how I proposed. What a romantic. That's sweet. Yeah. Truly. Yeah. And I know, I know you guys also shared your experience as you mentioned earlier about um, the miscarriage uh, mm-hmm. as well. Could you talk to us a little bit about your experience with that, Jordan? Yeah, um, sure. So, well, you know, it was, I think he was ready to have kids earlier than I was. So I was like, okay, you know, finally at the point where I was like, I'm ready. And it, our first pregnancy was a little bit of a surprise. It wasn't like we were like really planning for it, but just more open to it. And so I was like, oh, that was fast. Okay. Um, but it's a pleasant surprise. And I was, and then it was like, immediately I was ready. Like at that point I was like, okay, I'm in mom mode at this point. And so that was right before Christmas found out we were pregnant. Um, did a whole like, you know, a fun reveal with our families and everything. And then we flew out to Arizona, told his families. And then within a few days I was in the ER with some bleeding and they told us like, everything's fine. We don't know why there's bleeding. There's a heartbeat, like just rest. And so then I had a follow-up ultrasound, and that's when we found out we ended up losing um, that baby, which was really rough. And it was like seven to eight weeks. Um, And then got pregnant again really quickly about two months later and walked through the whole first trimester uneventfully. We had multiple normal ultrasounds. Everything was going great. Took our announcement photos. And then in the summer, shockingly, like at just a routine ultrasound, found out that we had lost that baby too. At that point, we were like kind of into the second trimester. Um, So that was... I mean, a shock and it was like a double whammy. And that was also right around the time all the COVID stuff was happening. So like certain things he couldn't come back with me for. And it was, it was a, I mean, especially the second time it was super traumatic. I had surgical complications and just one thing after another. So it just felt like salt in the wound. Like I didn't even know how to process that. So we took kind of a long step back because I was just so like, I think traumatized by it all, honestly, on top of like grief and then double grieving because I think the first time I was kind of like, okay, well, let's try it again, you know? And then when it just kept happening, I was like, oh my gosh, like what, what do you do with that? You know? Um, so yeah, that was kind of the quick overview, but it was definitely, I think a really, it was a really rough, like I would say year. 
of like yeah. just trying to make sense of something that didn't make sense. Mm-hmm. And I know you guys walked through loss as well. And I know you've shared that too. Yeah. It, it, it's exactly like you said, it doesn't make sense. And it's one of those things that you're very confused by because you don't know whether to push it off and be like, Oh, let's try again. It's a fluke. Yeah. Or fully grieve the loss of a, a pregnancy Mm-hmm. and it, it is it's just a very isolating feeling you don't know how to find words for it you don't know how to talk to your spouse about it and I remember for us um, it actually caused quite a bit of tension within our marriage because moving forward from that I didn't know how to communicate about it I didn't know where I stood on should we try again should we not um, I think I was more I we, we were in the same boat where he was ready I wasn't and then we got pregnant and I was ready and he wasn't. <laughs> um, and it was just kind of hard to, to feel like we were connected again after that and getting back on the same, um, the same, what's the word? Page. Like there we go. Length. Page. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I was about to say same side, but that sounded harsh. Page. Um, so in, in healing from that, and I know that word is um, hard because you could be healing for the rest of your life. Um, how have you guys dealt with that and trying to, to be on the same page and kind of work, work through it? Yeah, I, 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 I think the one thing I really learned throughout the process is just how differently men and women grieve, Especially um, something like, that. like, or, you know, fathers and mothers. Mm-hmm. Um, because for me, I feel helpless to stop it. Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like, you know, I view myself as her protector. And so. It's like to see something so horrible happening, Mm -hmm. like I almost didn't, I didn't allow myself to grieve immediately. Mm -hmm. It was like, there was a shock, especially the second one. I mean, being so far along, it just kind of, it made the first one pale in comparison. So, Mm -hmm. um, but like, it was like immediately like I'm in caretaker mode. I don't have time to grieve for Mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. Like I'll, I'll I'll get to that. I'll Mm -hmm. get to that. And Mm so like with her though, it was like a, a hurricane where it's just like everything all like, at once, yeah. emotions, you know. And you're physically experiencing it. Yeah, and she's, she's physically experiencing it, mm-hmm. and I can't. So mm-hmm. there, there's no way for me to relate to her 100%. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, we, we both lost mm-hmm. a child, but I think it affected her so much more personally because she was physically going through it, mm-hmm. and I wasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think on the other side of that, like in my caretaker mode, I had just stuffed a lot of the grief for a long time. Um, and that kind of like reared its head, um, you know, down the road, like six months, a year down the road. And we actually, we went to a grief counselor um, who specialized in uh, perinatal loss. Mm-hmm. And that was really helpful. We, we went as a couple several times. And then even individually for me to just like talk through, was like immensely helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, like, like I said, the hurricane analogy, hers was like mainly all at once, you know, the first couple months, you know, especially, especially the first couple weeks, mm-hmm. just a huge swell. And then it kind of like tapered off where for me, it was like low, low, low. And then there would just be spikes, mm-hmm. low, 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 low spikes. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think learning to, to live with each other's grieving yeah. um, styles mm-hmm. is, and, and, and know that the other person is going to grieve differently. Cause mm-hmm. l- like with you guys, like it caused tension with us mm-hmm. because she's like, what's wrong with you? Like, do you not like, why are you okay? Mm-hmm. Like she was mad that I wasn't like crying every single day. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I, I can't mm-hmm. like, I'm, I'm the, you know, the kite holder, so to speak. Like I, I, I need to make things happen because you're incapacitated, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And so n- not to take it personally, mm-hmm. but to just, you know, recognize that your grieving styles are different and you're both hurting mm-hmm. um, in similar ways. You just express it differently. Yeah. And I think you, he expressed to me, he's like, I actually feel bad that I like, because I don't have that like connection that you do, like, and the physical experience you have, like, I feel bad that I can't feel as bad. He's like, I am sad and I am confused and hurting and like angry. He's like, but I can, I cannot like get myself to feel it on the mm-hmm. same depth you do. And I think that was where some tension came for us, not only of where do we go from here and do we just keep like getting back on the wagon, especially after the second time I was like, no, I need a pause because mm-hmm. I was so like physically affected. Um, but you know, there was that conversation, but then there was also the, like, I, I think 
I felt isolated because I felt like he was being there for me, but couldn't really be 100% with me because he couldn't understand what I was fully experiencing. And so I felt this like divide a little bit. I was like, I don't want you to pity me. I don't want you to just like, I I appreciate that you're serving me. Like I'm I'm thankful for that. But I think I had some like insecurity almost Mm -hmm. around like, and he had insecurity that he couldn't feel as bad. But I think I had some, some struggle with almost just feeling isolated, feeling like, you can't experience this completely with me. I mean, you're standing here with me, but like you can't even make like all the hormones and all the things happening in my body and my brain. Like we can't hundred percent connect on. And that's a weird feeling when it's like, this is the co-parent of the loss that you've just experienced. And they're not even in the same place as you. I don't know. So there was a, a feeling of that. I think that created a little bit of tension too. There are so many times in life in my experience where whether it's like the proposals dating to getting engaged or like waiting on a child or waiting on your career to settle in where there are these waiting seasons uh, or the, the almost right. Yeah. And you say in your book, uh, you say, if you're not where you thought you'd be, you're in, you're in good, co- good company, <laughs> which I love. But how do you see making it through those waiting seasons well, you know, whether no, no matter what it is, whether you're like, Hey, I've, I've been dating this guy for three years and I'm waiting to get engaged or I'm waiting for this child as we were just talking about, or earlier in our careers, like how do you make it through those? Well, we've really had to learn how to hold both disappointment and possibility in the sa- at the same time. Um, and I think, you know, <clears throat> like, I don't know why I sound like I have a frog in my throat today. <laughs> I keep like, I don't know what's happening. Um, but I feel like what we've had to learn through, disappointments with the NFL not quite going how we thought and then completely recalibrating the life we thought we were going to have and loss and all the different things even our wedding date got pushed multiple different times because of football so there was a lot of different almost and waitings and not quite but we're almost there um we really had to learn like how do you like your life in the middle and we hear a lot about like build a life you love and that's the ultimate goal right like that's what we're working toward that's the the vision but sometimes in the middle and when things aren't quite settled or something feels upside down I've really had to learn like the challenges to even like life can be hard and it can be hard to love sometimes, but what can you do to make the most of where you're at? Even if you're still longing for where you hope to be, even if you're still longing for that child or that marriage or that wedding day or that next career opportunity, like you can simultaneously long for that, but still do things in the middle that you really like that bring you life, that grow your relationship, that grow you as a person that make you more interesting. So like we started doing different things. We started gardening partly just to help us slow down and get into a rhythm um, and have a hobby that we could share. Um, We started serving. We started hosting children in our homes, children in crisis situations through safe families. It's kind of like foster care light is how I would call it. Um, And at first I thought that was going to be super triggering and really hard, but it was actually really healing and Mm -hmm. like really opened our eyes to some things we felt like we were called to do in our life that we didn't really realize before. Um, And all of these different things, whether it's finding a hobby together, learning new things. Like I learned how to play poker in some of our waiting seasons, or like <laughs> I asked him to teach me more about deer and wildlife. Cause he's a hunter. And I started reading more books, like learning new things. We went on a hot air balloon together for the first time. That's something we've always wanted to do. And we finally did it. We ran into a tree when we first took off, which was terrifying. And I was like, this was a bad idea. Why did we do that? Um, but it was an amazing experience, you know, just like checking things off your bucket list, learning new things. Um, finding hobbies, whether that's as an individual or together that, you know, challenge you and grow you and open your mind, um, serving like different things like that can be ways to cultivate a life that you really, really like, even if you're not where you, where you'd like to be. Um, and we've had to learn how to do that to like, to make the journey a little more enjoyable, even if we're not at the mountaintop yet, because the reality is like most of life is actually lived in the middle is what I, what we found. Like we kind of are always aiming for the next mountaintop, the next book release, the next milestone in our life, whether that's a wedding or a baby or something else. Um, but when we get there, that's like 10% of the equation. There's two or three or four or five or six years before that of like working toward that and moving toward that. So if we're not learning how to make the journey more enjoyable, most of our life's going to feel pretty miserable because we're not going to spend most of our life on the mountaintop. And that's kind of the, the conclusion I think we came to. And you really and, taught me to slow down and do that, I think, in many ways. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, these middle seasons, the the waiting seasons are what really mold you and shape you. Mm-hmm. Um, not so much the mountaintops, mm-hmm. like it's the valleys and, mm-hmm. you know, the plateaus. Mm-hmm. It's like, who are you in that season? Mm-hmm. Um, and so to, to not overlook that. And I think, you know, like Paul says in Philippians four, like I, I have learned to be content in every circumstance, mm-hmm. like whether I'm hungry or well-fed mm-hmm. and it's like in, in spite of all those things, like, are you 
content, not, not complacent, mm-hmm. but content. Like, mm-hmm. are you okay with where you're at? And can like, you make the most of it? Right. I think like, I, I always reference that. I'm like, but Paul was also the dude who was thrown in prison, like not to get super vibrantly. Like he was the guy who was thrown in prison. And I always go back to that. I'm like, it's not like he was sitting in prison. Like, I love it here. It's awesome. Like their food's great. Like, no, I bet he was like, I can't wait to get out of prison. And that's sometimes how a waiting season can feel. It can feel like you're like mm-hmm. trapped and it's like, I can't wait to get out of this. I'd really like for this to be over. Um, but, but while I'm, I'm gonna, here, yeah. how can I make the most of where I'm at? Because I, and, and be used and make a difference where I'm at. Yeah, that's so good. And Sean, you could probably talk to this, but I, I, I kind of just as you were speaking, was thinking about like being content or being grateful or or like enjoying the little moments, as you said, Jordan. It's all, it's like you're getting reps in so that when you finally do hit the mountaintop or the peak, you can really enjoy it. Because mm-hmm. so often in my football career, it was like. Uh, I wasn't even enjoying my day to day because I was like, I haven't made it yet. I haven't made it. And then I got there and I didn't enjoy it because I wasn't used to enjoying things. Right. It's like, um, and you have a a chapter that talks about when your like dream becomes a nightmare kind Mm -hmm. of, Mm -hmm. uh, which I would love Mm -hmm. for you to expand on. But that, that is such a powerful concept of just like, really most of life is not standing on an Olympic podium getting your gold medal. It's like showing up to the gym every day and training and you have to enjoy that. Mm -hmm. And anyway, yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, no, I mean, I agree with you. I think, I think we can almost miss, and that's actually really key because especially as achievers and dreamers and people with ambitions, if we aren't making the process something that we notice and that we really are like present for and enjoy, it's not that it's easy. It doesn't mean it's like not hard. It just means that you find ways to enjoy it and make the journey a little bit more enjoyable. If you don't do that, what happens is you cross the finish line and immediately there's another finish line. Immediately the finish line moves. There's like, now I got to outdo the last thing I just did. And now I've got to, you know, double my performance from last time. And it's really hard to be satisfied in anything if you're not satisfied, like if you're not, if you don't find ways to be satisfied in everything, if that makes sense, because you'll get to the mountaintop, like you said, and you'll be like, well, now what do I do now? Who am I, you know, or how do I outdo this achievement? And what's the next thing? There's always a next thing. And I think that's what you really taught me is he was, you know, in my like, well, let's just achieve this big goal. And he, him just even asking like, why helps me get back to like, a lot of times we set, I guess, for example, we may set, I don't know, getting an NFL contract as the goal. We may set having a best-selling book as the goal. We may set paying off debt as a goal, whatever, or like, you know, making a hundred thousand dollars or whatever the goal may be. Okay. And I think sometimes we forget that a lot of times those are the vehicles to the actual goal. And what I, what I mean by that is like, we started to realize that the NFL was just one pathway to the life that we were really hoping for, which was a life of influence and making a positive impact. It was a life of flexibility. It was a life of like living a lifestyle on our own terms. Like, you know, there's other ways to do that. That doesn't mean we don't grieve the loss of football and like that community and everything that that brought us, but that wasn't the only way there. And I think sometimes we forget that when we get so fixated on the one thing and then we get there and there's always a next thing anyway, there's always another accomplishment you could achieve. So yeah, I think, I think learning to enjoy not only the process and the journey, but also when you get there starts by enjoying the process and the journey and being flexible with knowing and kind of always coming back to, okay, I think this is my goal. I think making six figures is my goal, or I think achieving X, Y, Z is my goal. But what is, why is that my goal? Because I think the why is really the what it's like, Oh, I want to be able to have a flexible career and spend more time with my family. Or I want to have a a way to make a positive impact on people in my community. Or, you know, you can kind of start digging into that and you realize like Mm -hmm. I could so easily miss that if I just keep getting caught up in the next thing I could do and the next mountaintop or the next summit to like climb. So I think that's why that's so key because it kind of keeps us grounded and like, what am I actually pursuing anyway? And how could I potentially lose sight of that if I get so wrapped up in the details or the finish line? Because I'm not going to be satisfied when I actually get there. What's one thing you learned about yourself in writing this book? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I really learned that I like to pencil in my own redemption stories. And I think we all do that, but especially as a writer, like I, so I, the interesting story with this book is I actually turned in a completed manuscript on June 1st of 2020. And I had told this kind of cliche story at that point I was pregnant, like 12 weeks pregnant again. And I had kind of told this like beautiful little like story of, Hey, if something doesn't work out the first time, like just get up and try again, it's all going to work out. And then 10 days later is when our life kind of crumbled again. And the story that I had written it ending a certain way completely went another way. And it's very strange to right in the ending that appears to be happening. Like I had all reason to think everything was good. Um, and for that to go completely sideways after I thought it was done, I mean, the whole book became an almost, to be honest, and it got pushed back a year and it was this whole thing. And I had to go back and rewrite the story, how it actually went. 
And that was rough. I mean, that was like not what I wanted to do. And if I learned anything, it was just like, man, like we tend to, like, I wanted to create this perfect full circle. And I think in the process, it actually became a more relatable message because we hear like, Hey, just get up and try again. But what happens when on your second or your third or your fourth try, you run into a brick wall again on anything, not just having a family. Like Mm -hmm. it's not just a book about that. There's so many other stories in there, but it was kind of this moment of like, wow, sometimes we have what I call like an unholy labor. Because when we think about labor, it's like there's always a reward on the other side of our effort is how we often think of it. There's a new life or there's a gift, right? On like the blood, other side of blood, sweat and tears, whether that was training for football and then winning a game or actual labor and a baby on the other side. But what about when you labor and you toil and you like hope and you pray and you put all your work in and the NFL doesn't work out how you thought mm-hmm. and you've got to release that or okay, we've gone through another loss or, you know, and I think that's what a story so many of us live, but it's not really talked about. And so I just had to learn, like, how do I handle when the redemption story I thought should have happened? doesn't quite happen the way that I wanted it to. Um, and I had to learn how, I think that refined me a lot, to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. I think it made the message stronger in many ways. Um, it made it more unique. It wasn't fun. Um, But yeah, I think, and I also learned sometimes the redemption stories we pencil in, like we want the perfect full circle story, like, and in our timeline, right? Like we want it to work out that way. And sometimes it does. And that's awesome. Sometimes it doesn't. And it actually makes us better. And what was interesting is I was talking with a mentor of mine shortly after all that happened. And I was like, I'm so confused. This This was supposed to be the redemption story. And it was just so violently ripped away in such an ugly, hard way. And she was like, I know that you feel like you got your redemption story robbed. And she's like, and I believe that redemption story will come in that way. She's like, but this was like six months afterwards. And I had told her about some of the growth we'd experienced between us and our marriage and things like that. And she goes, I still think there's a redemption story here though. I think your marriage needed some healing. I think your relationship needed some restoration in ways that you guys hadn't really addressed. Mm -hmm. And the, sometimes through the breaking of one thing brings the healing of another. And I think you guys desperately needed that for your family's foundation going forward. And so I guess the ultimate point I'm trying to make is like, sometimes we try to try to pencil in our own redemption stories and it's really hard when it doesn't go that way, but that doesn't mean healing or necessary restoration or redemption isn't happening. We just kind of have to like look for it in different ways. And that's at least I think what I learned in the process. All right. If you were going to sit down and give yourself advice the day you two got married. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So how how many, how, (laughs) how, how many years ago was that? Six years. Five Five and a half. Yeah, it'll, it'll be six this September. Yeah. Nice. So. What What would you say to yourselves uh, that day? <laughs> it's going to be hard. It's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done, but it's going to be refining, mm-hmm. and it's going to be worth it. Um, like, you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. So um, don't don't think, take for granted the, the good times or even the neutral times. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. Because bad times, you know, come to everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think you just appreciate the good times and the neutral times that much more. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah that's yeah. good. Um, I would second that. And I think I would also <clears throat> tell myself at that point where I think I had started to, uh, shortly after that, we had gotten really caught up in the achievement of things. And not that that's bad, but I think I would have shaken my shoulders and been like, hey, 22 year old me, you have no idea what's coming. Like, start on the sacred things before you're ready. Like careers, there, like there are seasons for everything. And I mm-hmm. think there was a, a short season there. Thankfully it didn't last too long, but there was definitely a season there where like my career was ultimate, especially as it started to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I held that even over like family and everything. And it was through loss, <clears throat> through loss that, that, why do I sound like I have a frog in my throat? <laughs> I don't know what is happening. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm like, I think I need water. Um, but I, I think through loss, like that shook me to realize like, that is really what I value. And like, nothing is more important than this relationship and what this relationship can build and careers will come and careers will go. Accomplishments will come. Accomplishments will go. But like, if you sacrifice your family or your health at the altar of success, you're not succeeding at anything. And I think if I had known that earlier, I don't know that our experience would have changed, but I think maybe my approach in the beginning would have been very different. And I just, I don't know. That's the advice I'd give to anybody who's young and married and bright eyed and like in the seat that we were. And that's what I'd go back and tell myself is like, Hey, don't sacrifice your family or your marriage or your health at the altar of ambition, because you'll always lose when you do that. So you said start on the eternal things. Or, or on the like sacred things, like sacred. meaning like, like lean into the things that are truly like, wow. like important and sacred and, and that you actually really value. Because I think, I guess what I mean is it can be really easy. And I know at least for me, I got kind of got caught up in the Instagram girl boss culture. Like, and I think anybody can do that. Meaning like, Hey, you've got to do all this while you're young and you've got to go after. Mm-hmm. And, 
And then I felt like my health paid the price. I felt like even kind of our relationship paid the price. And I, I don't say that like our loss was as a result of that, but I think that was the thing that jolted me back into like, why am I even doing this? You know, like I was just kind of on to the next thing and I just kept wanting to put off family and not think about it. And I think I missed, like I, if, if that wouldn't have happened, I don't know that I, I think I'd probably still have just kept doing that um, without any perspective. So that's what I say. Like, don't delay on the sacred things like health and family and getting married or commitment because you think you have to get ahead in your career or something else. Like those things don't hold you back. They just enrich your life. And I think I had the wrong perspective on that when we first got married in some ways. Dang, that's so good. I, I feel like we all share this quality where I'll see, I'll see where someone's at and then I'll try to set my goal with where they're at, but I don't factor in the idea that they're 20 years older than I am and 20 years further down the path. But my expectation is I'm going to be there, as you said, next year. And, mm-hmm. it, and it's, it's really in the almost or like focusing on the sacred things now, as you said, that ultimately helps you get to wherever your ambition is. So like, don't try to force it for now. Cause it is a unfolding process. And I think, anyway, I think you write about that beautifully. I love your story and I, I, I'm a big fan of you guys. It's, it's fun to see. I feel like we have some connection just cause Matt and I's uh, yeah. history together as the snapper world and the, and you know, <laughs> the help he gave me on the third date, yeah. to just lock yeah. Jordan in. but, uh, for those listening who uh, are interested in Jordan and her book, uh, and Jordan and Matt's, uh, content on online, we'll link all that down below, but do check out Jordan's newest book. Congratulations, by the way, it's called oh, embrace your you. almost oh, we appreciate it. and it's, it's powerful, but thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's been so fun to chat with you guys and just we're big fans of you as well. So really appreciate the support and awesome conversation. Yeah, Thanks, guys. Thank you.